I am Jeff Foxworthy and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Ooh, All right, like, Lanny. I like that. That's a good sound. That's a good sound. <laughs> Today we got a really interesting show. I think it's yeah. uh, you know it, it's a chance to learn about something we all hear every spring, but may yeah. not know a lot about. I have a super intriguing animal too. I'm just gonna go and tell you. Yeah, they really, really are. Looking around, Mac. We always talk about owls in the spring and their importance to a turkey hunter, Dudley. You know how important it is. Yeah. But do you know all the details about I, an owl? Honestly, I don't know a whole lot about owls. So let me set the table. So we've got we got two guests. We got a friend of mine from Montgomery that's uh that's just won a bunch of owl hooting contests. His name is Tony Graydon. <laughs> and he All right. There he is. He's on the line and <laughs> Tony's gonna hoot for us and tell us how he he, he does it with his voice. He's mm. he's amazing. Pretty good. I really good. Warming up earlier. Yep. Right? And um, and then we've got <laughs> Dr. Scott Rush from Mississippi State sitting over here on the couch, and he's going to tell us the science behind owls. All right. And uh, so, but Tony has got Tony is putting on a catch a dream event. Oh, good for you! Well, I and, hope that goes. I well. I think this is the third one, and so Tony's got to get out of here in a little a little bit to go do some TV stuff. But but Tony that Tony's uh, they're doing a fishing event. They're wearing the mossy oak fishing shirts. And All T- right. Tony, welcome. We're glad to have you on here. Hey, thank y'all for having me. I love your show. I'm I'm a big fan of Mossy Oak. Uh, y'all are kind of like family to me. Well, thanks, Tony. No I'm, I'm I'm glad you still have a voice after all of that uh, <laughs> audio. Uh, you know, it took us a while to dial in a, an owl hoot going through a microphone over the airwaves, and but we finally got it dialed in. So, no, no doubt. Well, you I, should be uh, good and warmed up by now. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important that we did that because we wanted to sound the best that it that it can. Absolutely. So, Tony, tell us how you what, – what do we need to know about hooting with our natural voice? Well, the first thing you got to do to hoot with your natural voice, when you're about 16 years old, you need to walk into a place called the Outhouse in Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama. Oh, there yeah. was a guy that worked there by the name of Bobby Cole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. long oh, time man, ago. I'm going to get some dirt. I love this. And so I walked in as a as a 16-year-old kid, and uh, I heard this guy hooting like an owl, and, and he actually sounded really good, guys. Um and that, believe it or not, was my first foray into trying to hoot like an owl with my natural voice. Um, Man, that was so, a long time ago. Uh, Small world. That yeah. was. I don't think was, I've ever heard you yeah. hoot, Bobby. Yeah, no. I, I, well, so when puberty hit, it changed. I, I was a, I was a late bloomer. World champion before that. <laughs> so Bobby was probably forty at the time, I guess. <laughs> I, I doubt that. I'm 52, so I don't. I don't think he's a whole. Well, I'm almost 52. Uh, I doubt he's a whole lot older than I am. But oh, um, no. anyway, <laughs> no. It it uh it kind of started there uh, when I was in high school. There was another gentleman in Montgomery that was around the turkey calling circles a lot uh, by the name of Charlie Lane, and uh, he passed away sadly several years ago of cancer. Um, but he kind of was like a dad to me. I lost my dad when, when I was 21 years old in 1993, Charlie was a big friend and he took me turkey hunting a lot when I was a young man. And, uh, he encouraged me actually to get in my first contest, which he ran here in Montgomery called the Southeastern open. And I competed in it a number of times and won a couple of contests there and then competed in the uh wildlife federation and mossy oak uh world championship down in mobile and in Mm -hmm. birmingham and uh placed in it a couple of times in the late 90s and then got into the grand nationals and and the best i ever did was second place but behind a guy by the name of bob walker from livingston alabama he can do it now and uh Anyway, he was the guy I always wanted to beat, and I finally beat him a few times here in Montgomery and, and a couple of times in the World Championship and, and the Grand Nationals. But Tucker Crisp from Mississippi was my nemesis. I, I just <laughs> couldn't get past him. 
and uh, I think he was born with feathers. But anyway, that's how it all started. And uh, as far as, you know, teaching anybody how to do it, the first thing I'll tell you is that you've got to get the cadence right. And there's basically eight, no eight notes of a barred owl. And the sound that I've always heard is, uh, or, the, or the words that you use to mimic a barred owl is, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And so if you can kind of, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, and kind of extend the all, you've got the basic cadence of what a barred owl's eight note call is. Now, uh, Paul Butsky and Dick Kirby said that, that Northerners never get it right. They're always talking about, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you's guys? And that one doesn't work. <laughs> Not that here. Doesn't work. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> very well in the in the bottomland swamps of South Alabama. So. Um, oh, might great. work up north, but but we've not had much luck with that down here. <laughs> so that that's really the basic, uh, the the basic notes of a of a barred owl call, and. What I'm really doing is kind of, it's kind of a diaphragm sound, I guess, if you will. Uh, if you started out with just a, just kind of a, a, a who sound and try to get a little more deep and guttural with it and then uh, getting the cadence right, I think is the most important part. And then the rolling part that you hear at the end is really kind of a combination of what I would call rolling my tongue and my, and my throat a little bit. Um, Oh, I don't know if that's coming through very it, well, mm -hmm. but oh, it, uh, oh, 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 oh. Lanny and I call that the Chewbacca so, effect. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's right. And then I honestly don't know what they're doing when they start the laughing stuff. Uh, Bob Walker was really, really good at the laughing sound, and that was his sound was winning contests. So I tried to mimic Bob more than I tried to mimic mimic a, a, a barred owl. Um, but the laughing sound was kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, a cacophony of sounds, maybe. Uh, that, that's a word that's probably beyond my vocabulary, but uh, it just, uh, it's kind of a, just a back and forth laughing and the rolling sound and, and all of that. So um, that's my best estimate of how to tell you how to, how to hoot like an owl. Practice a lot. Well, why don't we let him go ahead and, and make and call for us one time so our audience can hear what you what you're talking about? Okay. Oh, I tell you what, man, that sounds pretty good. It sounds real good. <laughs> So Tony, when when you're out hunting, is uh, you do you you don't do that whole that whole sequence, do you? No, it's really just more of the uh, the eight note call. I, I generally try to go a little bit higher pitched with it. That seems to elicit more gobbles than a than more of a subdued sound. I think if I try to do that right here, it might it might kind of mess up the the audio. But it's basically just the I'll, I'll make that sound, but I'll be a little more high pitched with it and maybe a little bit more fast paced, even more so than, than that of the natural cadence of an owl. It seems to get more gobbles, kind of the, the shock factor of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, guys that I've hunted with and it's just, sometimes it's kind of just gone to just a one note, just a long, loud kind of scream and that will make them shock. Yeah. Out. Um, and it's, it's, inter it's interesting to me that, you know, a lot of people, uh, I have buddies that are very successful turkey hunters that don't necessarily sound exactly like a barred owl. You know, one of my buddies kind yep. of sounds like a cross between a coyote or a dog and an owl, you know, more of like a, whoo, you know, <laughs> I can't, yep. I can't yep. really do it very well, but, um, that was good. Doug. You know, anything that's similar to an owl, but has that quick, uh, yeah, higher pitch, like you said, provides that shock effect. Yo, Joe Champion, rest I, his soul. He had a, you know, he hoo ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scream at him, and he'd scream at him, and they'd mm -hmm. gobble. 
So, Tony, the guys that are owl, in the owl competitions now, are they using their natural voice or are they using other pieces of equipment? They're, yeah, they're not now. Um, it, when I was coming up in the contest world, you couldn't win with a with a commercial hooter, uh, one of the reed type hooters. And, and honestly, the technology was not very good then. Um, I think Buttsky had a call called the Real McCoy Owl Hooter that was maybe one of the first reed style hooters on the market. And uh, Billy McCoy, who who uh, passed away a number of years ago, was a close friend of his and a guide. And uh, he had competed in contest, and they called it the Real McCoy because of Billy McCoy's name. But um, that was the first reed style hooter that I remember hearing, and it still was not quite as realistic sounding as the guys that that could do it with their voice. And and um, back back in the '90s and the early 2000s. If you used a commercial hooter in a owl hooting contest, you were pretty much assured that you were not going to win. And now that the, the table has flipped and the technology's gotten better, the realism of the of the commercial hooter sounds so much better now. And I think the, the hard thing for somebody that's trying to, to compete with their natural voice is getting the volume that you need for the judges to really hear what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit harder. Um, although I have kind of thought about going and trying it maybe one more time as an old man, just to see how I could, how I could do it with my natural voice. Um, the last contest I won was in Alabama, probably in 2003 or 2004. I had, I had quit competing probably around 2000 and, uh, my wife and I were on a trip going through Ozark, Alabama, and they were having the state, uh, turkey calling contest the next weekend. And she didn't know this about me. I, you know, I figured talking about being a world champion owl hooter might not be the way to get her to say yes when I <laughs> proposed. So, so uh, we were riding through Troy one day, and I said, you know, they're, they're having this turkey calling contest next weekend. I think I'm going to go down there and compete in it. And she was like, what are you talking about? And uh, I ended up going down there, and I think I got second place uh, that year. But it was mainly guys that had the – the owl hooters at that time there were not many people using their natural voice by by that point uh i'm just gonna say it why don't they have two separate categories that would be great i I think we ought to talk about talk to the nwtf about that and you know that for a while they did have a natural voice turkey calling contest i think and i don't know that they're doing that anymore but um it's really really neat you know my my biggest regret was uh, back whenever they were doing this, David Letterman would have the people from, I think, the gobbling contest and the owl hooting contest would come on his show. And the year that I lost to Tucker Crisp in Atlanta, I think I lost by one point. And I think they all got to go to the David Letterman show, which is pretty cool. Excellent. Well, you know, our very own David Hawley uh, got to run a mouth call on the Letterman show when he was a young lad. Yeah, uh, that's cool. He sure did, but but look, you're on the Gamekeeper show. <laughs> even better, even better. Uh, David Letterman doesn't right. anything on us. Your daughter's been begging you to hunt since her little brother shot the big eight last year. You've ran a fire, dissed the fields, got stuck, got unstuck. Planted food plots, fertilized, and prayed for rain. You moved trees, limbed roads, even bought one of those fancy cell cameras. So what's your excuse? LS Tractor. Moultrie has pioneered the game management category. Today, Moultrie is one of the best-selling brands of feeders and seeders in the world, and they continue to innovate with new technology that gamekeepers will rely on. Moultrie products are always field tested and designed for hunters by hunters, combining forward thinking, innovation with time tested practicality. Moultrie, first in feeders since 1979. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site wide discount at MoultriefEeders.com. Use code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount. When you get in the woods, you can be a little intimidated and not want to booger up a turkey. It, so it, there, it takes a little time to kind of get that confidence to make that first, okay, I'm going to try this and see if this works. But have you got a tip for somebody? 
my tip is uh, don't don't limit yourself. Just do it. I mean, you know, if the worst that happens is I, I haven't honestly ever had a turkey that got boogered up from an alcohol. Now, you know, speaking to a turkey that was still on the limb with a turkey call, I might have messed up there before. But I think turkeys settle back down. They're used to hearing all kinds of noises. I mean, I've heard them honk at an 18 wheeler that was slowing down and and kind of going through the gear shifting phase i've heard them you know uh <laughs> gobble at, at somebody blowing a car horn a door i've slammed the door to the truck getting out before and had a turkey gobble at it so it's really more of a shock response that you're wanting out of it and i don't think that you can do a whole lot to to mess up the opportunity for one to gobble with a with an owl type sound even if you're not very good at it well, I'll tell you what, it'll hurt your feelings, though, if one has gobbled a few times and then you're trying to move around and get to him and then you say, well, let me just try to make sure where he is and you owl hoot and he doesn't gobble. It kind of makes you like, ugh. Yeah, I get a little bit paranoid about hooting in that exact scenario. Uh, you know, I, I like to try to strike him up in the morning some and I, I seem to do it less than I used to. I, I tend to wait and, and see what, you know, if the gobblers wake up, but... Yeah, like at 10 in the morning, if, if you've heard one gobble, you get that courtesy gobble, and then you want them to gobble again to try to, you know, dial in his location. I, I seem to be a that little be, bit paranoid about doing that. That might be crow call time. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, guys, uh, I've got uh, – this is a – we've got a real special treat. We've got – Lanny has brought his oh, gosh. owl call in here, and he has agreed – <laughs> he has agreed to run. At, Tony, we, we would like for you to judge this. Oh, God. I knew he was <laughs> going to I knew he was going to do something. So, Lanny, without any further ado, could you uh, – Well, I think uh, if his was loud, I mean, mine's going to be a real loud. Well, let's just try. On these mics. Well, push it away from <clears> you. <throat> let's okay. just try. Or maybe you stand up or something. I'm going to have to stand up to do it properly. Well, let's – here we go. So uh, just to narrate, Lanny is now standing up. He really doesn't want to do this, do but for the sake that. of the show, he's going to do it. Yeah, and this is an old Reed call, like you know, like he was referring to, that I've had, uh, had for years. Dudley, I would appreciate that. <laughs> okay, the everybody don't look at Lanny. Yeah, don't look at <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we go. Man, that sounded pretty good. That is awesome, that, and it and it has that slightly higher frequency shock effect to it. You know, that's right. I so so judging wise, if I'm going with realism, I would say that your your roll at the end is maybe just a little bit too long. Ah, uh, but <laughs> but but other than that, it it, uh, it sounds really good, and I guarantee you that sound will make one gobble. Well, I appreciate that, and my roll is too long. I I've, I've often screamed. Uh, if they won't gobble on the first who cooks for you, I put that ha <laughs> on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well that's that's, that's Joe Champion coming through in my uh in my hoodie. That that sound really is the one that seems to elicit the gobble anyway. I, I don't think the who cooks for you does a whole lot. It's the it's the shrill sound at the end that really makes makes them wanna wanna attack you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you woke up Scott Rush over there on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> did it did it peg out the mics? Yeah, we're good. It I sounded did. good. Yeah. Good. That's great. Yeah, do you want to do it again? No, no. <laughs> I have some other scenarios. <laughs> I, I kinda wanna hear a Bobby Cole natural yeah, voice out of it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I think my voice. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a, a legitimate question. My voice doesn't sound the same now it as it did when thing, I was twenty-two. You know? <laughs> is it puberty? Or, uh, I mean, I can't do it like I used to could. Maybe those tea treatments will help with you, Bobby. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Dudley. In the, in the words, in the words of Toby Keith, you're just not as good as you once was. Right? <laughs> yeah, there's some truth in that for sure. It takes some lung capacity uh, um, now to do it. Just out of curiosity, do you still owl hoot a lot in the woods when you're turkey hunting? I do. I do. I, you know, that's kind of my go-to call first thing in the morning. Um, 
you know, in, in Alabama, I don't know how it is in Mississippi, but we have some places that I hunt, a turkey will gobble in the pitch black dark. Mm-hmm. Other pla- other times and other places that I hunt, they seem to be right at daylight. So, um, you know, if, if it's dark and I feel like I can get one to gobble, if I think I'm close to birds, I think an owl hoot is good. You know, o- other mornings, I, I kind of vary it. I'm like you guys. Sometimes I just let the turkeys wake up. Uh, other times, if I'm not hearing anything right at daylight, an owl hoot might might actually elicit that response. So, um, I think that's, that's, that's kind of my that's pretty spot on. One hundred percent. You know, especially the the early stuff. I'm the same way. I mean, when it's dark, that's what I'm doing. As it breaks day, you hear that first crow. You start thinking, eh, well, maybe I need to. And, and oftentimes it's not, I mean, maybe if you don't get a turkey to gobble, you mm-hmm. get the owl started yep. and maybe another owl will get one to gobble. Yeah, mm-hmm. and oftentimes it'll carry, you know, in those bottoms and owls will start hooting hundreds of yards off and you can hear a turkey way off. Maybe yeah. that you wouldn't have heard. That's that, right. That's right. That's exactly right. That's that's the other thing I'll say, um, and y'all hit that on the head. If you, if you can get another owl to hoot at a distance from you, you may not have a bird close by, but you might make one gobble by getting another owl to talk back to you. Yeah. It, might, it might be helping out somebody else. And I tell you, <laughs> you if go. you've ever been in a group of barred owls and you think we're calling loud and they're hooting loud, they're loud. I mean, loud. So They are. As a young kid, I started recording them. I just always thought they were fascinating sound birds. They actually kind of scared me a little bit whenever I was probably 10 or 11 years old and my dad would send me to a tree stand by myself and the first time I heard the the laughing sound and the scream um I might have needed to change my pants it's a black panther (laughs) yeah exactly we got lots of those in Alabama as everybody knows Mm -hmm. we appreciate you you jumping on here we know you got a busy morning and uh we're gonna we're gonna turn talk start talking to scott over here you're welcome to stay on and listen but thank you for joining us and and good luck this spring yeah yes sir thank you and i appreciate uh all you guys do to help us with catch a dream and our event and uh it's a great partnership and uh thank the world of all the people at mossy oak as you can see i'm proudly wearing my bottom land yes today. sir heck yeah, yeah. appreciate yeah. that yeah tony yeah. killed a big deer with his bow this year oh nice yeah yeah, yeah. I don't, have we hit the horns for somebody that many times? Tony's gotten a lot of horns in there. <laughs> All right, Tony. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you all for having me. All right. Appreciate Scott, it, Tony. Scott, we're going to talk to you about the science of these owls. And that, have, Did you get a good night's sleep last night, Scott? You I did. did. This, this couch is just – it's really It nice. is. <laughs> I mean, the turkeys is nice. It is. Uh, <laughs> That's my nap couch. Yeah. I, I'm listening. I just got my eyes closed. Isn't it amazing how a person can sound so much like a – it, it mimic the sounds of, an, of a bird. It yeah, really is. Yeah. So, uh, look, we want to ask – we all, we hear these owls all the time, and, and we just kind of gloss over it. Mm-hmm. What can you teach us about barred owls, and what are they doing in the spring when they're making all this noise? So – Barred owls are, uh, you know, they breed once a year and um, kind of going into late winter, early spring is when they're they're hyped up and starting to breed. So they're they're communicating with each other. Most of the time, owls are pretty solo. You don't see them hanging out in groups, but um, the males are searching for the females and the females are, are responding to some of that activity. Um, you find a lot of dead barred owls on the road, typically... Um, December into January that time of year and a lot of that are just these younger males moving around and and some of the older males too just looking for the females and those those males some of the the relationships that they have the male will bring the food to the female and drop it off to her so they may be moving around looking for things to eat and and bringing it back to the females as kind of a courtship situation so is that a male call that we're hearing or a female or do they both make it they both do it um Females are bigger, or tend to be bigger um, in barred owls, but I don't know if you could necessarily hear the difference between the two, as far as I know. Yeah. So, so Richie, we've got some recordings of barred owls. Can we play those now? And then if, if you could speak to this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So that's what we typically hear uh-huh. in, in the woods. But there'll be some variation of that. Sure. And, and so that he's just commu- trying to communicate with other owls. Pretty that, much, yeah. That's uh, and if you could put it in human terms, that's kind of their their I'm here, where are you type call, um, searching for each other. And then once they start that duet, which I I call the monkey call, where they're they're hooting back and forth to each other. That's when they're in close proximity and they know that they're there and they're starting to talk to each other. Hmm. I've got a really dumb question. Mm-hmm. When I'm sitting on my porch and hearing these owls, I live in this little island of hardwoods in the middle of town. Uh-huh. Um, and so I'm hearing them all the time. And I'm not a very good owl caller. Um, but do you think that they think we're an owl? If we're pretty good <laughs> at it. <laughs> or, or do you think they're like, what was that? Well, it's a fair question. Yeah, I obviously don't know what they're thinking. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a dumb question. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> we'll preface this by saying that owls are really good at what they do. They're exceptional hunters. They, their populations are continuing to to increase, and you know they're expanding westward. But in general, they're if we were to put it in terms of intelligence, they're probably not super high. Um, so they may hear a sound and they might hear it differently than we do. You know, they've got the discs on their face that channel the sound to their ears. So we put things in human terms, but they might be hearing it different than we do. But it's probably some of that vibration and some of that noise that they're picking up on. And I think, you know, the, the question of when the, the turkeys call in response to it, it's not so much that who cooks for you, but that trailing off that, that rattle at the end which is like a turkey's gobble, right? So the turkeys are hearing that, and it doesn't sound, doesn't have to sound exactly like it, at least as far as we're concerned, but it's it's that same intonation. Um, you know, you might hear a jake break on a truck or something like that, and that rattle could be something similar to it. Yeah. And you might hear a turkey respond to a, a truck going by. Right, or my neighbor's uh, ranger at 7 a.m. Yeah, yeah, exactly, or even a weed whacker <laughs> or something like that, right? So it's it's that the energy in the call that they get. So, so barred out, are they feeding on mice and rabbits or? Yeah. So they eat mice, they eat birds. Um, they'll eat crayfish. Um, basically anything that moves, they'll eat it. They, uh, you know, I've heard stories of them eating fiddler crabs down South if, mm. when they come out, but, um, they're, they're not super picky and they're kind of generous, but it, they're, they're carnivores. They'll eat anything that has meat in it. They'll even scavenge on dead things like a deer carcass or, um, you know, anything to get the energy. Hey guys, Dudley from Gamekeepers here. I want to tell you about the all new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed for everywhere. I'm kind of curious, is there sure. anything that we can do as gamekeepers to try to make our property a little more attractive to some barred owls? Yeah, so the, I mean, the the barred owls are, the population-wise is going pretty well, increasing, um, despite them getting hit on the road and some other issues that we can talk about in a little bit. But they're cavity nesters by and large, so they like to nest inside of boxes um, or hollow trees. So you can put a a wood duck box out and as long as the gauge for the opening is big enough for an owl to get in there, they might use it. Um, the height doesn't really matter. You know, they can be within five feet of the ground or they can be probably 25 feet or more above the ground. Um, so as long as you have a location for them, they might start using it. There's sometimes they will build a, a shallow kind of cav or a, a bowl type nest, but for the most part, they're, they're going to use uh, cavities for nesting in. So you know that CSP program that, that yeah. folks are applying for, um, you can be rewarded for leaving what they refer to as a snag, which is just an old tree, and they'll you know they'll they'll grade you based on how many snags you have that uh, benefit things like woodpeckers and insects and owls. owls. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I mentioned that the owls are they're not the smartest things. I remember finding a a barred owl chick inside of a wood duck box that didn't have a top on it. And the adults had nested in there, but the, the young, the one that young that hatched was totally exposed to the elements and couldn't get out. 
because it couldn't climb up the inside of the box. Mm -hmm. But the adults were still bringing it food, and it ultimately perished, I think, just because it couldn't get out of there. But they just saw it as a cavity. They didn't think ahead to how the young are going to get out of it. So if you do if you do put a wood duck box out or something like that for them to nest and just make sure that it has a lid on it and it's it's kept up. So it would take a larger hole than a traditional wood duck box opening, wouldn't it, for a barred owl? It would. You know, I, I couldn't tell you the specifics right off the top of my head, but barred owl males are they can be considerably smaller than than a um, a female. I've heard of some really small barred owl males that are about the size of a screech owl. I've not seen it, but you know they can be tiny, and then a a big female can be a, a couple pounds. Um, so um, size is is important for them to get into. It. Yeah, it does have to be larger than a wood duck, but arguably you could fit a male through a wood duck hole. I, I've just assumed. I, I think I've seen owl boxes, and it seemed like that hole is round. Where typical in a wood duck, it's more oval, like the one behind you, Lanny. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but they don't care. I mean, as long as they can fit through it, yeah. they'll use it. And think of something using a cavity in a tree. It, it's not going to dictate the shape of that cavity. I'm looking at uh, owl boxes on, uh, you know, just Google images. And mm-hmm. a lot of them do look very similar to a wood duck, wood duck style uh, nest box. Sure. And they're easy to make. It's really um, just a few boards that you slap together. And I'm seeing a lot of screech owl nests. So when you think about it... Uh-huh. There's a lot of competition for what few probably cavities there are out there. Sure. There, there's because we well, last week we talked a little bit about uh, uh, what was that fowl of the kestrel American uh-huh. kestrel that uses cavities yep. in, in the woods. Probably doesn't need a real big cavity. But, no. But uh, and then wood ducks serve. And you know, and we've just heard that because of logging practices, there's just not as many cavities. So maybe that's why this CSP program is sure is yeah. even out there. Yeah, even things like barn owls, which are different than barred owls, but they're cavity nesters. And many places, their populations are not increasing strictly because they don't have the places to nest. Well, Dudley, weren't you mentioning your friend Kyle? Yeah, Kyle Liebarger, uh was installing a, a, a barn, B-A-R-N, owl nest uh, in the top of a barn, you know, so the, the roof is like a triangle and sure. they installed it up in the top and it, it was just a big, almost like a shelf yeah, yeah, up yeah. in there. Mac, have you got a question? Yeah. So, I mean, we as, as turkey hunters really think about the, the barred owl, but I mean, how many species are, I mean, how many owls are in North America? I mean, it should be, I mean... 20, 30 spe- different species. Yeah, so eastern U.S., we have the, the burrowing owl down in Florida. Sometimes we get records of them overwintering here, but they don't necessarily breed outside of Florida in the eastern U.S. Um, get the eastern screech owl, the barred owl, the great horned owl. Um, and then sometimes, you know, you get an eruption year where you get a snowy owl. Um, you can get short-eared owls and long-eared owls that come down during the winter. Um and if you get up into the northern parts, you can get hawk owls and great gray owls. Um, and you get a, a greater diversity kind of out west. But um, around here, you're, you've just got a handful of species, really. Do, do we have that great horned owl? We do, here? yeah. Um, and I won't even try to attempt to mimic their, their sound. But oh, come where, on. <laughs> whereas the barred owl goes, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? The great horned is, who's awake? Me too. It, it's, ah. it, seems, it doesn't have that rattle at the end. It's more muted, yeah. um, and it's just, you know, kind of like a hoo-hoo-hoo, hoo yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, probably yeah, a turkey's yeah. not going to respond to that because it doesn't have that rattling on it. Right. So, right. But he's hunting much bigger prey than, than a barred owl is. They can be. Um, Potentially a turkey. Yeah, yeah, they could if you get a big one, a big owl, that is. Um, yeah, they're a great horned will eat a barred owl. Um, also eat a screech owl. A screech owl could eat a, uh, or a barn owl or barred owl could eat a screech owl. Um, so, you know, it's all kind of size related. They'll eat each other <laughs> given the opportunity. I just, I don't really hear screech owls much anymore, but you know, when I was a kid, uh, uh-huh. I remember just, you know how you remember things, but around my grandparents' house, there was just. Uh, their town was Canton, Mississippi, and there was just old water oaks everywhere. You know, sure. just big, old, mostly water oaks. And uh, you could go outside at night and hear 
hear screech owls all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe it is the cavities that are limiting them. I don't know. Um, but you, you certainly don't hear as many in some places as you used to. Well, I'm, I'm kind of interested in doing some stuff to help bring them back. So I thought... I thought I was hearing screech owls, but I think I may be hearing uh, maybe maybe a barred owl just make one long uh, screech, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. yeah, so barred owl will do that. Barred owls can sound like somebody's being murdered. Um, they'll do a, a screaming type. B-A-R-N. Yeah, barn. Okay, that's a yeah. barn owl. Barn. Yeah. Did we finish that thought? I, did, did I interrupt y'all about the barn owl box in the, in the barn? Did y'all finish that? Well, we were we were just talking about how it, you know, it's different than a lot of the owl nesting images, you know, nest box images you see when you Google it. But it's it's almost like a rectangular shelf that you fit up in that triangular portion of, uh, you know, the top of a roof. And it's translucent, so you can see what's going on in there. Well, it's just wide open. Um, they'll take boxes too, or they'll take a shelf. Um, the barn owls, that is, they. They're not real picky about it. Um, another place that you very commonly find them uh, is a shooting house. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. You know, Especially a hunting blind. Windows open. Yeah. yeah. You ever done that, Lanny? I just, I've just had to clean them up a lot. <laughs> yeah. A whole lot. Uh, Get a lot of pellets and whitewash yeah, in there. Yeah, lots of stuff in there. But yeah, close your shooting house windows, people. Close it, yeah. <laughs> hey, I got, uh, I appreciate y'all giving me a chance to talk here, Dudley and, and Bobby. Uh I think he's being facetious. Yes, what you got, Lanny? <laughs> so you were talking about uh, the – we talked about, about their, their hunting. One of the most intriguing things to me about owls is their their ability to hunt. And can you talk about a little bit of the physiological characteristics about the reason they're such good hunters? Like I, I think from what I understand, they disturb – less air in flight than any other bird. I've You can hear other birds flying, but I don't uh-huh. know if I've ever heard an owl fly. And and I think too, don't they kill? Isn't it an impact in that how they they typically uh, get their prey is through um, blunt force trauma? It can be, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you know when when people deal with an owl, they're usually afraid of the beak, but it's more the talons that are going to be the ones that hurt you. Um, they're needle sharp, and when a most of the owls are they're perching birds, right? So if they're going to perch on something, they're going to grab it. Um, and just having the presence of those those pads on their feet and those needles, they'll they'll grab something and, and spear it, um, hit the internal organs. But I have a, a captive barred owl that I care for, and when I feed it dead mice, first thing it does is it crushes the skull with its beak. So they do have a pretty powerful beak, but it's mm-hmm. typically the talons that are going to be the, the first point of impact. Um, with their feathers, if you look at the edging on their feathers, especially the, the primary feathers, secondary feathers on their wing, they have a lack of a better term, a feathering on the edge that breaks the, the sound or the air going over it. So it, it mutes the sound that it makes. And a lot of the owls, even down to their feet, you'll see feathering out to their toes. And that basically just cuts the noise and acts as a, a buffer to it. So their whole body is essentially made for being silent. Mm-hmm. Think about it. You ever heard, I mean, you hear birds flying all the time. We hear about ducks whistling. You hear about turkeys flying down. Even songbirds, you hear them fluttering. Have you ever heard an owl fly? No. And, you know, and I've been sitting there in the spring and they would come through. Yeah. You, you know, you can see them, but you it, never hear never them. Never hear them. Yeah. No. yeah it's, silent it's amazing for something that big, yeah. too. The, That's what's always amazed me about. And that. aren't their bones hollow? Uh, hollow in the sense that they. They don't have a marrow the way that we do or a lot of mammals do. Um, they're they're hollow, but they have struts inside them, so they're stronger, like an airplane wing almost, um, which gives them that that lighter load, but also the they're they're pretty strong. Yeah, if you ever pick one up, like if you find a dead one, yeah. they weigh it's like they weigh nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're you see their heads, and their heads look really big, but a lot of that's feathering on it, and they have that that parabolic disc on their face that channel the sound back to their ears and their ears can be at different heights on their skulls on the two sides that they get different noises and can direct their heads to that. So um, I guess they hunt by hearing as much as sight. Or? They do. I mean, they have big eyes. Um, if you look at a, at least a bar to L skull, the eyes are probably a little bit bigger than its brain cavity collectively. Um, so their eyes are huge, and they actually have a, a bone ring around it to hold the eye in and also protect it a little bit, because otherwise they'd just fall out. But uh, 
a lot of the barred owls, they can hunt during the day, they can hunt during the night, and they can hunt dawn and dusk. So they do pick up a lot of light with their eyes, but most of it is, like you said, that, that sound and picking mm. up. It's an amazing animal. I wonder what they yeah. taste like. Oh, my gosh. Probably not. There's well, probably not they, a whole lot of meat to I it. I think they, they probably taste like a felony. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's a, that's a fair question, though. So one of the, the issues, I think that's becoming more and more obvious with a lot of the raptorial birds, including owls, is uh, rodenticides. And people uh, people will try to control rodent populations, especially around corn or some other bait that they might have. And if those rodenticides are an anticoagulant for the blood then an owl eats the rodent, whether it's dead or close to death after it's eaten the rodent and, or the rodenticide, and then the owl can bleed to death or the raptor can bleed to death. So oh. for all intents and purposes, that raptor is probably a better rodenticide than the rodenticide that you're putting out there. So if you're storing grain or bait in a, a shop, you might want to try to get a, a barn owl in there just to have that biological control rather than spending money on, on buying the rodenticide for yeah. it. Yeah, hmm. I like that idea. That reminds me we need to do that at the nursery. Yeah, that's um, a good idea. You know, because we have so much food at the nursery in the form of acorns and pecans and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we'll put owl houses up. That'd that, be great. Uh, yeah, that'd be you cool. know, any kind of rodenticide doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah. It's like we need to have some uh, owl houses out there. So one thing that I've always been curious of is like if they migrate or not. So prior to this podcast, I was researching it. And so they tagged uh, or banded 158 barred owls. And they found that the, out of those, none went farther than six miles. Mm, so the fact that they are being able to you know reproduce and move out west, like Dr. Scott was talking about, it's pretty interesting since they don't necessarily migrate or move that far. So their home range is pretty small. Yeah, it can be a, you know, a couple miles um, home range wise, but their, their species, despite getting killed on roads and other things that are doing well, and they're starting to actually habit, habituate to urban development. Um, I think Raleigh, North Carolina has some in, in the middle of downtown that are nesting. Um, oh. Wouldn't be surprised if other cities do too. So they can move distances, like you said, not too far, but they can also habituate and start using a lot of these places that they didn't use to. Pigeons are probably great prey for Oh, them. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. Pretty tasty. Yeah. yeah. So from what <laughs> I've read, they're, they're displacing the spotted owl out west. They are, yeah. Areas. Yeah, yeah. As, at least as far as I know. Um, so the barred owl didn't necessarily occur there. Um, the barred owl and the spotted are not too different from each other. The spotted smaller. So the barred owl just can push them out or even kill them. Um, but the barred owl distribution is changing because they're coming around the, the northern part into the west and then dis, uh, disrupting the, the spotted owls that are there. So the two species didn't necessarily come together historically as far as, as we have seen in, in people lifetimes, but now they're starting to interact a little bit. What do you, what do you think uh, you can attribute that to? Um, just landscape changes? Yeah, landscape change, whatever the drivers of that are. Um, you know, so the barred owl is going to like uh, kind of edges and forested areas. Um, so as forested distribution of forested areas changes, it creates a stepping stone for them to get over there. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting from start to finish with a single implement. It's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. This is Lanny at the Gamekeepers of Mossy Oak. I've been shooting Nosler bullets as long as I've been wearing Mossy Oak. Nosler ballistic tip ammunition is made for knocking deer down right where they stand. Nosler's famous ballistic tip bullet is the key. It has controlled expansion and bone crushing punch to turn a whitetail's lights out. Bring home more deer this year with ballistic tip ammunition from Nosler. Buy now at Nosler.com. So the other owl that we have, the screech owl, mm -hmm. yep, little is little small owl. Yep. What kind of sounds does he make? Can you mim mimic him? No. <laughs> <laughs> they almost make a horse whinny. Um, it's it's a trill, but it's a little higher than a, a barred owl, um, and it's it's more prolonged. I think Rich, have you got one, Rich? Wow. 
Well, huh. Have you heard that, Lane? I don't think I have. What would Hayden do if he was sitting next to you? <laughs> if, was it dark outside? Yeah. <laughs> he might run. Well, that's a, that's a real interesting sound that they make. It, it is, yeah. It, when I was looking at that, it lasts like just a few seconds, but it has 35 notes in it. Wow. Like Quite wow. a musician. I've, I've got a question oh. for you, Doc. Um, so a lot of folks listening to this are most likely turkey hunters or sure. listening for the, for the barred owl aspect of this. So how, how long in the day are barred owls communicating? So like, should you not owl hoot or, or screech, you know, after 10 o'clock or lunchtime, or like if you're looking to get a shot gobble or locate a turkey? Oh, that's a fair question. You know, I think I've heard them calling pretty much all day long. Um, You know that they can be out hunting all day long. Um, Sometimes they might go into siesta time towards the mid afternoon, but generally they're going to be out fairly regularly, at least until 10, 11 AM. So they're not as nocturnal as, as I guess think that they are. So, I mean, they're, they're not just moving around at night. I mean, they're, they're during daylight hours. Sure. Yeah. It would probably more so at night, but there's nothing to say that they don't move during the day. You know, there's some people that believe if you see an owl in the daytime, that that's like an omen or it's bad luck or. Yeah. Yeah. So, where, where did that come from? Uh, it's probably just correlation, right? I mean, you see, you see, what is it? A what's the, the rain bird, the cuckoo, it's going to rain. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of cuckoos and I've not seen it rain immediately after. So <laughs> yeah. um, superstitions yeah. just kind of take over, I think. They definitely, in my mind, seem to be individuals and, and have, have, have a personality. Yeah. Some of them, you know, you see them 300 yards away and they fly off. And uh-huh. some of them you can get 15 yards away from before they do sure. anything. Yeah. Just or scary. not even move. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. They they do have personalities, even in what they eat and how they eat it. Um you see some that'll eat the heads off of rodents, and others will eat everything but the head. Hmm. That's just personal preference. Hmm. So, so I, I just remember this, but but my daughter Jessie did uh, last year went with some uh, Cherokee Indians in the uh, North Carolina mountains. There sure. was there was a cave, and there was a drawing of a turkey. In okay, the, it, it itched in a wall there, and and and. <laughs> the uh, whole process of interviewing these guys about, uh-huh. about the cave owls got brought up okay and it was they were talking about how that members of that tribe if i hope i'm getting this right sometimes viewed seeing an owl in the daytime as, as an omen sure it, but so this guy she was talking to he was he was having to do a lot of work with the tribe and maybe taking when they find uh, when they found a, somebody that was um, when they were building something, if there was some bones there, they might have to take them somewhere and bury them in a more respectful place, move sure. the bones and everything. And he was just talking about all the things that he dealt with. But it, at the end of the conversation, he just said, "Sometimes it's just an owl." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know that you just didn't need to freak out about it. Sure, you? it was just an owl. Yeah, there. and there's a lot of cultural symbolism for owls, uh, for good and for bad. I mean. For as many cultures as you can find that might treat them as a bad omen, you can probably find as many cultures that treat them as a good omen. Um, Probably the more recent use of an owl as an indication was in, uh, was it Flowers of the Killer Moon? Or the, uh, yeah, is that right? Killers Killers of the Flower Moon, excuse me. Great Where the the owl comes in. In a movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where the owl comes in as kind of the omen of death, I think. Oh, they have a mystery to them. I've always been intrigued by them just because they're cool. Uh, but, I mean, I guess they do have a... I never, I've never been freaked out by an owl, but now I might start being freaked out by it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm, there's I'm around a, them all the time. There's an Andy Griffith episode where yeah. Aunt, they're wanting Andy to marry their daughter, That the darlings that come into yeah. town, and he's, they going to make him marry. And an owl shows up. <laughs> and an owl shows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Blame everything on that. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. What else do we need to ask him? I've got one. Uh, with the increasing population of owls. Mm-hmm. I, you, would, I wouldn't say all owls, but yeah, for barred owls anyway. Okay. Do you think that 
that has any effect on ground nesting birds, aka the bobwhite quail? Mm, good question, Mac. I don't think so. Um, you know the the things that are probably affecting bobwhite quail, and this isn't my area of expertise, but you're losing kind of those those early successional places. You've got yeah. fire ants. You've got bigger issues than something that might occasionally eat one, but isn't always putting pressure on them. Um, so I don't I don't think it's an issue. Tony, uh, you're still on here. Would you uh, Would you have a question about owls? I don't think so. You guys have done a great job asking questions. Uh, one thing that I will tell you that probably nobody will believe when you were talking about them hunting at night and things of that nature, my brother-in-law was sitting in a deer stand about, I don't know, 30 years ago in Georgia, bow, bow hunting, I believe. And he said he saw an owl come by before daylight right in front of his his stand at about eye level and landed in a tree next to him, which he didn't really pay any attention to it. And he said it was extremely cold that morning. He had on gloves and he was rubbing his hands together, as you could imagine, kind of in front of himself to warm his hands up. And then he was putting his hands in his pocket and he had an owl come out of the tree and hit him right behind his arm with his talons. Hmm penetrated penetrated his jacket he knocked it off it flipped him out and he swears to this day that that happened and and i saw the jacket with the with the holes in it and the marks in his arm so um a, kind of an unbelievable thing do you hear of that very often of, of anyone ever getting attacked by an owl um not to say it doesn't happen i don't think it it happens regularly but uh yeah, I wonder why it, it hit him, whether it was nesting there or it heard something that he was doing and, and came out to investigate it. Um, he he wondered if for some reason, you know, he said I was, my silhouette was all the way up against the tree. My hands were kind of close into my body. And if maybe that rubbing his hands together looked like a squirrel's tail or something, you know, to this owl. Although I know they have incredible eyesight. He, he that was kind of his his estimation of what might have happened. Sure. I mean, that punching behavior could be that it, it perceived him as a predator too, and was trying to knock him away. Um, right. I know if I, for an owl that I've dealt with in the past that I put out food for it and I wasn't paying attention and it, it punched me in the face flying down to get the food. Um, so I, I think either, you know, as food or as a potential predator, they could, basically act the same and, and hit you sure well that would i tell you what that'd wake you up in the day <laughs> yeah yeah sure, yeah. Sure yeah yeah he he uh he was not excited about what happened that Oof. i bet yeah i bet that hurt <laughs> <laughs> well guys what so, else uh, what, are there any other questions we need to be asking scott if not we'll uh ask him one trivia question and see if he can oh, win a prize wow. for a listener <laughs> So uh, we'll turn our attention. I'm, we're going to hand the show off to Richie right now. Richie, uh, can you cue up the trivia question? Today's trivia is brought to you by Sheffield Financial. Fuel your GameKeeper projects with financing for power sports, outdoor power equipment, and trailers. Begin your next conservation adventure at SheffieldFinancial.com. Lanny, we had Dudley and I had a lot of fun at NWTF standing in the Sheffield booth. Yeah. People walking by and. Did they? Did you talk to them about financing the wedding? No, I never got to. It was <laughs> something I should have brought up. Uh, they were pretty busy. Yeah, and, we'll talk uh, to them about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get with them on that later. We'll start a GoFundMe <laughs> for you. <laughs> Oh, mate. So, all right, Mac, have you got the question? I do. All right, Doctor Scott. So you're playing with B Rad and with B Rad. It, it's B Rad. That's one of Bobby's favorite characters. It's triple D forty four. So it's B dash R A D D D four four. Hmm. Okay, so that's the guy. He left a review. And uh, he's got a chance to what? But Richie, is there something I'm missing here? <laughs> Richie's, Richie's sm got a big smirk. All this, all this c code. These young people have these codes. Scott, are you, these kids that you teach at Mississippi State, do they ever try to play pranks on you with little? 
codes and stuff? I'm sure they do. I probably just don't even realize yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I thought B Rad was B-Rad. a real name. That's, yeah. Well, I mean, one of your favorite movies. Yeah, it is. It was a favorite movie. What's, what, what's the title of that? I Malibu's could, Most Wanted. I think that is. That is it, one yeah. of Bobby's favorite titles. Yeah. So, I, I laugh out loud. At that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the winner will get the number five of the Gamekeeper Turkey Vest. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. That's a great deal. So Look guys, at Mac doing what, the Vanna White, uh, showing this thing off over here. Leave so. a review and you got a chance to win one of these Gamekeeper turkey vests. Or you can go to Gamekeeper Fieldwear. And right now they're offering a, a 25% wow. off. Nice. There you go. Thanks. So the code is PODCAST25. Yeah. So you're you're making money. You're saving money if you listen to this podcast. <laughs> 25%. That's a slick looking turkey vest. Yeah, it really is. All right, go ahead, Mac. All right, Dr. Scott, this is a a layup question for you, I believe. Uh, All right, so we've all heard that an owl can spin its head around, but can an owl spin its head around 360 degrees? No. (laughs) We got it. (laughs) Yeah. So tell what what do we need to know there, Mac? What's the answer? I think we get Dr. Scott to get it. Tell us. Okay. So physiologically... So what what would have happened if I said yes? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a trap door over there. Yeah, it is. No, <laughs> they they can't. They can turn their heads. I think uh, closer to 270 degrees. That's exactly um, the number we had on the, for the answer. <laughs> wow. And, and part of it, you know, if we turn our heads, if we turn our heads 270 degrees, we're probably dead or paralyzed. But <laughs> the cervical vertebrae keep us from doing that. But it's also the blood flow. So you've got your jugular and carotid arteries and veins in there that. If you turn too much, those get shunt off and it cuts the blood flow to your head. An L, let alone in the vertebrae, but they also, their their vascular system is slightly different than ours. So in turning it, it doesn't shut those two things off and they can keep that blood flow to their head. So they're going to pass out on you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a bunch of anatomical things that allow them to do it. Two hundred. So how far around is 270 degrees, Lanny? That's three quarters of the uh, way around. We got yeah, ninety, one eighty, uh, two seventy. So three, three quarters. Yeah. See how fast I did that. Well, do, do west. Mac, did you text him my answer? Because that's exactly the answer. <laughs> how about that? Well, yeah. I don't know that we've ever had a guest nail the answer quite a, <laughs> quite that because that's exactly what what uh, the answer. Well, I was worried. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that's a beautiful vest, and I'm glad that. Uh, B Rad. B Rad won. Yeah, yeah. It's one way. All right, B Rad, you need to get in touch with us. And the rest of you guys, leave a review. You got a chance. We still got, uh, I think, I mean, four more. Four more. All right. Six total. So. Sweet. All right, guys. Uh, look, I don't know what else to ask you. I, I've learned a lot sitting, uh, well, on this one. Mm-hmm. I didn't know some of this stuff about owls. Is there anything else you, that you can think of you need to make sure we know? You know, I, I'd have to, to look at the, the details on it, but they, with their vision, they may honestly see an ultraviolet too. Ooh. So they might be able to pick up urine trails and, and things from small mammals, not just the hearing and the sound, but other methods like that. So they are, they're exquisite eating and killing machines, mm-hmm. but they're, uh, they're essential for everything that we have around us. So they're pretty cool. That's cool. Animal, no doubt about it. One of my favorites. Yeah, they really are. And in the spring of the year, our favorite time of the year, it is so much fun to hear them. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine the woods without them. Yeah. yeah that's right. Waking up without it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, sounds well, like home. Yeah. So it, it sounds like they're in good shape. So it's not something that we need to be concerned about or trying to help them out in any way. Sounds like they're they're doing just fine. Pretty much, yeah. At least uh, all the metrics we have suggest that they're doing well. Some of the other species of owls, not as well, but um, bards are certainly doing well. Yeah. That Go sounds good. Out. All right. Well, if nobody else has anything, why don't we? Uh, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us <laughs> out of here, Richie. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast, and be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine, and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.